Pink Floyd grew from friendships forged in the 1960s in the university town of Cambridge. Britain was then in the grip of psychedelia and the hippie scene as well. Popular music was undergoing a huge transformation and the young Sid Barrett was wide open to these influences. The name Pink Floyd first began to appear in January 1965 when the group was then known as the Pink Floyd Blues Band. The band featured a five-piece lineup formed from a group of friends from Cambridge in England and originally included Bob Close on guitar and vocals. Bob didn't stick around for too long and neither did the blues element of the name. By the summer of 1965, the band was slimmed down to a four-piece and the name too was reduced to match. For the next couple of years, the band would be known as the Pink Floyd. Had a strange hobby. By 1967, after the obligatory personnel shuffles, Sid Barrett fronted a band which moved to London and now comprised himself on lead vocal and guitar, Roger Waters on bass, Rick Wright on the keyboards and Nick Mason on the drums. Understands. She's often inclined to borrow somebody's dreams till tomorrow. There is no other day. Let's try it another way. You'll lose your mind and play. Free games for me. Emily cries oh. Gazing through trees in sorrow Hardly a sound till tomorrow Piper at the Gates of Dawn was produced by EMI staff producer Norman Smith, who'd earned his spurs as an engineer on the Beatles albums. Norman was used to experimental attitudes, but even he must have been puzzled by a band that had two distinct musical personalities. Well, Norman Smith did the first few albums he'd done and taught us a lot about uh, what was going on. He basically had been the engineer on the Beatles and uh, George Martin had been the producer and he wanted to do a George Martin, basically, so he was looking at people from the point of view of discovering a new Beatles and becoming a really world name like George Martin and get percentage points off, off groups. And he, he looked at us and he, he did us and the Pretty Things when they were doing their Seth Sorrow and their sort of, well, quite good concept album thing. Um, and he taught us a lot of stuff, but he, you know, he didn't want us to get wilder and wackier. He wanted things to be, you know, he wanted things to be more regular and single. He wanted us to do lots of hit singles and be like the Beatles, I think. Well, if I first may turn to Roger, I want to ask one fundamental question of which our televiewers may not be quite aware of the significance of it because they didn't hear all of it. Why has it all got to be so terribly loud? Unfortunately, Sid Barrett was showing signs of rapidly declining mental health, caused by a terrible overindulgence in hallucinogenic drugs, such as LSD and anything else he could get his hands on. By the time the band came to make its second album, Sid was no longer functioning as either performer or writer. It's awfully considerate of you to think of me here, and I'm most obliged to you for me. Making it clear that I'm not here And I never knew the moon could be so big And I never knew the moon could be so blue And I'm grateful that you threw away my old shoes and brought 
Now without Sid to call upon, Pink Floyd needed both a guitarist and a writer. Finding the guitarist was relatively easy. David Gilmour, friend of Sid's from Cambridge, had been drafted in as the fifth member to provide on-stage cover for the increasingly unstable frontman. I went to see them at the Royal College of Art. It must have been in October or November. And at, the, at that College of Art one, I was talking to Nick and he said, um, you know, be prepared, you might easily be getting an, an invitation soon. And, I mean, I, you could see quite easily how how horribly wrong it was all going for everyone. <laughs> and uh, they weren't enjoying themselves very much. Sid Barrett made only a marginal contribution to A Source of Honest Secrets, the second Pink Floyd album. The pop sensibilities of Piper are increasingly buried under layers of avant-garde experimentation as Floyd begin to grasp their way towards the sound which made them a worldwide success. In addition to studio recordings at this time, Floyd were also producing soundtrack music for films. The original soundtrack for the film, More, was the first of two soundtracks made for the French director Barbette Schroeder. With Atom Heart Mother, the band was now firmly into its musical stride, and the signs were auspicious for the next album. When it finally arrived in November 1971, Medal was to exceed all expectations. With this album, Pink Floyd demonstrated that the group had learned how to take their original sound effects, which the band had made their own, and weave them together with the music to create a seamless blend, which was to become synonymous with Pink Floyd. The results are best seen still in Echoes, a classic slice of Pink Floyd. This hard-earned skill developed over the previous four albums was to become a hallmark of the Pink Floyd sound. The metal album, to me, is the point where it all started falling into place. The Echoes piece itself, sort of 25 minutes long, going through all sorts of different moments, all of which are, are, are really good. So, yeah, that's, uh, that was leading the way towards the dark side of the moon. Pinging at the beginning was Rick, and we had uh, 
put a microphone onto a grand piano and run it through a Leslie speaker, which is what you usually use for the Hammond organ. And uh, every time, as Rick was tinkling away on the piano, every time you got to one particular note, it would pick up a resonance through the, through the Leslie speaker. And uh, so he just started making up that intro piece, um, which we then recorded. Um, and we left it at that. We then carried on and we did loads and loads of other demos for that album, for the metal album. And we, that was the first time we started moving out of Abbey Road Studios, in fact, because uh, they had not got 16-track tape recorders, whereas George Martin had built his Air Studios and they got 16-track tape machines in there. So we, I think we moved up there to make most of that album, but we did a lot of the demo stuff for it at Abbey Road. And the very beginning of that Echo's track was from the demo. And when we tried to reproduce it, we couldn't ever get it to sound quite the same again. So we actually had to use the demo piece up to up to the first chord change, I think. And we then and edited on to something, another piano through another Leslie that we recorded somewhere else. Overhead the albatross hangs motionless upon the air And deep beneath the rolling waves in labyrinths of coral caves An echo of a distant time comes willowing across the sand And everything Echo has also formed the foundations of the superb film Pink Floyd at Pompeii, directed by French director Adrien Marbet. <laughs> 